Kitchili Mudra, and again in earlier tantric texts, there are uh, there are Kitchili Mudra is, is taught, and normally it's a, a, a hand gesture of some sort. But within these Hatha Yogic texts, in fact, we get a very brief description of it here. Uh, next, the yogin should turn back his tongue and hold it in the hollow in the skull while looking between the eyebrows. This is the sky waving seal, Kitchili Mudra. And uh, it's sort of, there's all kinds of uh, linguistic puns going on. It, it, it suits, um, it suits the, the name suits the practice very well. Kechari originally is a type of yogini, and it means uh, one who, it means a, it's a feminine word, so it's a, a yogini who flies through the sky. K is, ka is the sky, K means in the sky, and chara means moving, so Chari is a feminine form of that, so she who moves in the sky, or through the sky. So it's, yeah, it's uh, when I was talking the last couple of days about these um, early yogini cults where uh, people would try to propitiate, try to please these yogis with offerings of various things, including sexual products and so forth, to come down one class, one group among the 64 yogis of the kitchen. And they're, they're normally at the top, they're the kind of most powerful. So within the, the, the tantric tradition, some of these mudras are meant to uh, either do the same thing to kind of gratify these kitchen, so they come to you and give you boons, or they're meant to make you assume their form, their consciousness, or make your consciousness uh, become kitchen as well, so move in the sky. So there's still this, this idea that I mentioned in the context of Buddhism, that if your mind can assume the form of the sky, the ether, k ka means the same as akasha, I was saying about this unconditioned karma in Buddhism. So if you can assimilate your consciousness to the ether, then that's a, a way of, of getting enlightened. Um, but then on a on a much more, you know, uh, simple level, gross level, ke, ke or ka means the void, means a space, just like we, we talk about space and a space, a hollow or something. Uh, uh, so ke chiri means that which moves in a space in a void. So when the tongue, the tongue goes up above your palate into the cavity behind your nose, so then it's moving around in space. So there's lots of sort of interesting puns made about this in, in, in the Sanskrit text. Um, so now, yeah, like that is one verse we've got here, whereas that, the, what I did for my PhD, that whole book is about this technique. Um, so it goes into how, how you get your tongue to be able to do this. Because in earlier treatments of meditation, you know, you're quite often told just to turn your tongue back and press it against your palate. Just hold, hold it there whilst you're, whilst you're meditating. But then this is a sort of quantum leap beyond that, where you, uh, in the text it teaches you, most of the text teach you that you have to lengthen your tongue considerably. And one of the ways of doing that is cutting that, the binding tendon there. Using a blade, the shape of a certain leaf, and then meant to nick at it once a week, and then rub salt in, and that slowly gets it, frees it. And I did, I did do that a little bit, but I think it grew back rather, rather quickly. And it says, it says you should do it once a week, which is hopeless actually, because then it grows back it's definitely straight away. So you have to do it every day or something. Uh, and then, but actually, what's more important? Is loosening the, the back of the palate. So, the, uh, is it, is it making sense what actually Are you happens? About the soft palate or yeah, the, yeah, the soft palate. Right. And then the tongue sort of flicks up behind that because it goes up and then forward. People kind of assume, and mm. when you know, you get, I'm going to talk a bit about it later on, but uh, this, is, this technique is always associated with going into kind of trance for long periods of time. And lots of famous reports of yogis being buried alive in India and stuff. And so when the, the British, you know, the colonial Brits, the 
they became fascinated by this. You know, there were lots of sort of papers written on the art of human hibernation and stuff like this. But there were quite a lot of the guys doing it were complete con artists and managed to trick them. But there were a few cases as well where, um, you know, where perhaps you know they were successful in doing it. But they, the, 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 the reports always think that because they, they realize when the when the you know, he comes out of it, you know, he flicks his tongue forward and everyone thinks that he's swallowed his tongue, but in fact, I think swallowing your tongue is actually physically impossible, but what happens with this is it goes up behind the soft palate and comes forward. And so like I was saying, uh, if, and if your tongue gets really long, which mine hasn't done, uh, you can move, you can block your nostrils off from behind, so you don't need to use your hands. I put the sign as well. Yeah, exactly. So kind of Agna Chakra, or is yeah. that a part of it? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of, and, and then and, and, and people have interpreted as, you know, you're tickling your pineal gland with your tongue, like we were talking about yesterday, but I don't think that's necessarily the idea of what's going on. But the, what I mentioned yesterday, these kind of two different paradigms of, of what people are trying to do with these techniques. Um, one of them is to seal off so this is where this sentence, the notion of mudra, a seal, becomes particularly appropriate, is to seal off the amrit, the nectar of immortality, or the bindu, or whatever, that's dripping from the top of your head and getting either expended or burnt up in the, the sun in the stomach. There's this idea of a moon in the head and the sun in the stomach. Um, but then the other notion, and I'll come on to this, a bit more afterwards as well, but this uh, is this idea of Shakti Chalani Mudra, which is sort of not in this text actually, it comes from a <coughs> comes from the sort of the, the tantric kundalini tradition, with this idea that by stretching your tongue, by pulling on your tongue, there's a, a Nadia channel that goes right down to the, the base to your Muladhara chakra where Kundalini resides and that wakes her up, you know, she goes, straightens her up and off she goes. Funnily enough, when I was doing my PhD, I, you know, I wanted to find people who did this, so I spent quite a lot of time, about, I'll show you a picture of the first guy I, I met. Um, so I spent a lot of time wandering around, going to various festivals and ashrams and you know, these places to, to find people. And I think I found six or seven in the end. But that was the only way I could do it. But now with the internet, there are these groups of, of uh, Western yogis, and some of them are into it as long as a site, I don't know if anyone's come across it, called AYP or, or, or dot or advanced yoga practice. And it's, it's, the guru is someone called Yogani, but he's anonymous, which is quite interesting in itself. He never kind of appears to anyone, he never appears in public, and he write, writes books and he writes stuff on this website. And there's a bunch of people there who have got to write into Kitchen with her. And so there's long discussions about you know, the best way of Cutting or frenum, and apparently they, they've all decided that cuticle scissors are the way for them. Uh, oh, <laughs> <no. laughs> <laughs> but but if that, that I would say is now far and away the best sort of practical resource if you're if you're interested in <laughs> Well I remember I mean obviously for a while I was very interested in all these things and I remember reading about, hearing about Gene Simmons, who was the lead singer of Kiss, oh, yeah. band yeah. Kiss, yes. and he had his, his of, yeah, 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 so he had a really long time, yeah. okay. and, uh, mm -hmm. he had it done in an absurdity. Yeah. Not for spiritual reasons, but for I the don't rock and so. roll. Rock and roll. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, interesting thing. Just, if, you're, if you're meditating, you know, to turn your tongue back anyway, yeah. just to think about that. But when... But it feels like. Well, it feels because your tongue is in the void, so it is—it's pretty curious. It's not touching anything at all. It's an empty space, so it kind of the void of sensation. I mean, I can do it. There's not much to look at. Do you want to do it? Yeah. <coughs> <laughs> oh, wow. So it's going through the space. What happens? It's, it's odd because it doesn't quite. There's this. What, the strange thing that happens is that your mouth fills up with saliva if you hold it for a long time because you can't really swallow it. Uh, so, and then that is interpreted as being the umrah in some way. Mm -hmm. So 
so yeah, so you're, like, you're holding it there. That's the idea. And then they say that you know, as you, some of the texts teach that uh, the longer you do it, the better you get it, and the more the purer your system, the taste of, of the fluid that's produced becomes more and more refined. It starts off sort of salty, it goes through to six or eight flavors, and eventually ends up tasting like honey, and then the nectar of immortality. Perfected. On our East Asian context, lecturers was talking about a sect with teeth gnashing saliva collectors, which is it's kind of yeah. I don't know, maybe there's no connection at all. A yogi sect. Yeah. Kind of yeah. Uh, or maybe even a kind of Taoist right. s uh, sect. Teeth gnashing know. saliva collectors. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I wonder if there's some yeah. some crossover in some way.